I can see uh, uh, participants are, are flooding in. We'll wait a few more minutes to give uh, people to uh, the chance to join, but in uh, two, three minutes, we'll get started. Hi, Ms. Gutland. Great that you could join us. Uh, we were worried that there were technical problems. Um, I'll be chairing the event and we'll start in about uh, a minute because I can see that there are still uh, the number of attendees is running up very fast. So we'll still give people a, a minute to join. Okay, it's two past three. So uh, I, I realize we all have busy schedules. So um, let's get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm Ben Anstus. I work at Car Market Watch. I'm, we're one of the one of the four organizations behind this event. Uh, European Environmental Bureau, FERN and Climate Action Network Europe uh, are also organizing this with us. And we're very grateful to our hosts, uh, MEP Jutta Guteland and Mikhail Wiesig for taking the time to, uh, to join us and to give their insights into this topic. Um, some brief house rules before I, 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 I pass the floor on to uh, our hosts. Um, the recording and the slides will be shared afterwards, unless there is a speaker that prefers not to share theirs, but they, uh, they have all agreed, uh, I think. You have a Q&A tool. You can always ask questions. You can also upvote questions that you find the most relevant. It is a very short event, less than an hour and a half. Um, so we can only take really the most relevant uh, uh, um, general questions for the a general event such as this. Um, so your votes can actually help us determine which ones we will uh, we will ask the panelists. Um, we will also ask the speakers if they have time afterwards to answer any questions in writing, but that will be fully at their discretion, of course. Um, and with that, I'd, I'd like to hand over to to our uh, our two hosting MPs, uh, Ms. Jutta Guteland and uh, Mr. Uh, Michael Wiesig, uh, both members of the MV committee. Um, and I'd like to get started with two questions for you. Um, why do you think that CDR uh, or karma removal is an important uh, topic to discuss right now? And how do your groupings and the MV committee in general uh, approach it at the moment? Um, I suggest we go with, with um, uh, ladies first, perhaps. Uh, Ms. Gutland, if you want to start. Thank you very much. And um, I would like to start by uh, saying that I'm grateful to uh, co-host this uh, important webinar. And uh, indeed, um, it is an important question uh, because we know that in order to uh, both uh, be able to deliver the European Union's own target, climate targets, but also in order to respect the Paris Agreement, we did need to do much more. And we need to do more both on uh, re uh, reductions, but also removals. And I think um, uh, at the later uh, decades, uh, the removals part will be even more uh, 
important. Uh, but I do think uh, to be able to succeed, we need to start the work. And uh, it is timely because we discuss it now, we discuss it in, in different uh, uh, legislative uh, proposals. In ETS, uh, it is relevant to discuss uh, how we can improve uh, and, in, and make sure that we promote innovation and uh, and uh, innovative uh, uh, technology here. And I think we can do that uh, by, uh, by using the, the funds, uh, like the innovation fund, and we can improve the, uh, the rules there. Uh, but I do, uh, I do not think that it should be part of, uh, of the ETS uh, pricing system. Uh, I think that could be giving a double commando to the industry uh, that might not suit uh, the purpose. But I really believe we can use ETS innovation fund and helping this important uh, uh, tool that I definitely think uh, should be used. And I also see great potential in other areas as uh, um, of course, uh, the, the carbon farming, uh, forest policy, and so on, to make sure that we do more here. Thank you. Ms. Wiesig, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much uh, for the floor, for inviting us for this uh, event, and I'm especially grateful for the organizer, organizers that they get at such prominent speakers uh, on this topic. Um, to, to maybe answer your question why this is an important topic, it, it's pretty much uh, obvious that it keeps popping up also uh, in the legislation that seeks solutions to climate change, mitigation, adaptation, uh, well, starting with uh, EU climate law where both technological and uh, natural carbon sinks uh, were to play a role. So this is really an up-to-date uh, topic uh, which is being discussed heavily and uh, the well, adequate uh, legislation is uh, being really uh, held on the table. Uh, if I am going to reflect maybe the situation uh, with the setup of the parliament or maybe the political groups, uh, I, from my own perspective, would have to say that uh, I'm a little bit worried, uh, well, quite a lot uh, worried, uh, because I see a sort of tendency uh, of... Uh, well, one-sided approach uh, to this to this topic uh, within the main uh, main political uh, lines. Uh, there is obviously a trend to prefer technical solutions, and saying that uh, there is also a tendency to somehow neglect or not uh, fully utilize the natural solutions. Uh, out of the technological technology, sorry, technological solutions, carbon capture and storage, as well as carbon capture and utilization, should according to the Commission. Uh, ETS proposal be financed via uh, innovation fund uh, boosted through the millions of ETS allowances. Electricity only bioenergy plants with carbon capture and storage are eligible for subsidies beyond the date uh, set by the red directive to phase out support uh, for this uh, installation and even the transport of CO2. I assume to serve the carbon capture and storage installations can as well be in accordance with the new 10 e regulation a project of common uh, interest, meaning uh, being of strategic importance for energy union, even though CO2 is not an energy carrier. One really might ask and wonder why is it going this direction and uh, whose interest is it serving? And there are even more worries to come uh, to me. According to the synthesis study from 2020, the commercial industrial carbon removal methods being incentivized by governments are net CO2 additive. Uh, that means that CO2 emissions exceed uh, their removals. Other study claims that when we calculate also upstream em emissions, the carbon storage equipment carbon uh, captured uh, the equivalent of only 10 to 11 percent of the emissions. Uh, the newest IPCC uh, report claims with high confidence that poorly implemented bioenergy with or without uh, carbon capture and storage can compound climate related risk to biodiversity, water and food security and livelihoods, especially if implemented at uh, large scales. Yet uh, CCS nowadays seems to be the new silver lining around the bioenergy policy. Um, from ecological point of view, I really wonder 
why ecosystem-based and novel approaches to how we remunerate natural carbon sequestrations are never really considered being and innovation. Instead, we prefer burning trees with a higher emission of CO2 per unit of energy uh, compared to, for instance, coal, and then sucking up uh, the emissions and call it uh, a technological breakthrough. But it is a practice with a footprint and impact on forest ecosystems and their ability or capability of storing carbon. Until 2015, uh, according to EAA, EU forest land was able to remove around 7% of total EU emissions, which accounted for around 300 million uh, tons of CO2 equivalent. But by 2030, the same land area will removing only or will remove 40% less uh, of uh, these equivalents. This is serious, and we need to improve this. Uh, the European Parliament is considering, uh, through the individual amendments of members, financing nature restoration of forests and other marine and land-based ecosystems, including financing for the creation of nature conservation areas through ETS, real news. Lulu CF target could be partially built up through carbon farming initiatives, I personally propose that this should compromise also conscious choice of non-intervention regime in forests. Removals by dead wood are analogous and even more effective to capturing carbon in harvested wood products. And this carbon feeds in the soil, which at the end benefits the forest ecosystems, its biodiversity and all the precious services it provides us. There is always a tendency uh, to assess the utility of any approach from the perspective of the commercial interests. And if that is the case, we have to develop the carbon farming schemes and uh, incentivize carbon removals in the land system, including by restoration of carbon rich habitats. Even arable land can uh, cease to be a source of CO2. Uh, the nature presents us uh, really with amazing opportunities for carbon removals, and we can be innovative about uh, remunerating it. Uh, and I would really wish uh, to conclude <laughs> that as many people in the parliament uh, will be excited by the synergies for climate and biodiversity and quality of life that these natural removals represent, uh, and hopefully by the same way that they got already excited by batteries and hydrogen. Thank you very much. Thank you for those those great comments. There was already a, a clear divide between the natural and technological uh, uh, carbon removal approaches, uh, which is, of course, every single time we have a discussion on CDR that comes out. So I'm very happy to hear about that different policy uh, um, uh, spheres where you see uh, importance for this. Uh, that's great. Uh, we'll go deeper into these topics, of course, today. Um, I, I hope you'll all find it interesting. We've got a, a uh, I, and I'm, I'm saying this uh, uh, without blushing, a very distinguished series of panelists. Um, I must warn you, panelists, I will be very strict with the timing as it is a very short event. Um, so I'll give you warnings if you're going over time. We'll start with uh, Jessica Streffler from the Potsdam Institute for Climate uh, Impact Research. Um, Jessica, the floor is yours. Uh, I know you have slides, uh, so toss them up. Yeah, thanks very much for the introduction and thank you very much for the invitation. I'm happy to be here, to be able to speak here. And to start out, I would like to take a bit of a broader view and look at what is carbon dioxide removal and why do we need it and also how much do we need. And if we look at the role that CDR plays in transformation pathways, we're often looking at graphs like the stylized graph here, uh, where we see emissions and in the 21st century, so that's greenhouse gas emissions, fossil CO2, uh, CO2 from land, and also the non-CO2 greenhouse gas emissions. And then on the, on the below zero line, um, the removal parts from CDR. And there we can see that uh, CDR can play three different roles. Uh, one is a faster reduction of net emissions. Um, the second one is compensate residual emissions to achieve net zero and then possibly towards the end of the century, net negative emissions in the long term. However, um, we've already heard a bit about that. These faster emission reductions can only be achieved if carbon removal is additional to emission reductions. So in the European context, if it's not included in the ETS, if CDR is included in the ETS, then it would replace mitigation and would not be additional, would not lead to a faster reduction of net emissions. But if it's additional, we can achieve that, and that may actually be needed as some studies point to lower emissions in 2030 and cost optimal pathways um, than those that are currently envisaged. 
Um, also always uh, important to state, I'm sure you all know that, but let me say that up front um, again, CDR is always limited and it can be associated with negative side effects. So it can only be used to complement emission reduction, to complement ambitious emission reductions and can only be used to compensate for the last few percent of emissions. And let us take a deeper look into that, um, into CDR requirements in 2050 um, in, in the IPCC scenarios. So since we're talking here in the context of the EU targets, uh, we're mainly looking at net zero by 2050. So to achieve net zero in 2050, that already tells us that our demand for carbon removal is defined by the amount of residual emissions. And if we look here at these um, illustrative pathways of the IPCC, they show that roughly five to 10% of today's emissions are compensated by 2050 to achieve net zero. Um, there's one a bit more extreme scenario where it's 20%, um, but also the median of all scenarios is roughly 10% of today's greenhouse gas emissions. So that's about the order of magnitude we're talking about here. And again, the availability of carbon removal in 2050 is still uncertain. So what we want to do to achieve net zero is sort of to, to look at that from two angles. And one is to reduce residual emissions as low as possible to limit our dependency and our reliance on carbon removal. And the other angle would be to develop carbon removal technologies now so that they are available at large scale towards 2050. So now what is actually CDR? Um, the IPCC provides us with a definition um, that refers to anthropogenic activities that remove CO2 from the atmosphere and store it durably in geological, terrestrial, or ocean reservoirs or in products. Excuse me. Um, and that means, of course, that CCS, carbon capture and storage itself, is not a CTR, CDR technology, but it needs to combine, be combined with carbon sources from the atmosphere, so bioenergy or direct air capture. And the same holds for carbon capture and utilization. Um, if that's applied to fossil fuel CO2, then we're not talking about carbon removal. However, if we look at it a bit more closely, there is a way that CCU can be considered CDR. Um, and if we distinguish here on the left-hand side, the sources, fossil and atmosphere, and the use and either short-lived products like synthetic fuels or long-lived products, then we can see that fossil CO2 that's used to produce synthetic fuels is still CO2 positive. So we have here only a double usage of CO2 that can lead to 50% of emission reduction, but that's of course not CDR. And only the combination of atmospheric CO2 with usage in a long-lived product can lead to net negative CO2 and can, lead, uh, can be considered a CDR option. Of course, there are many different CDR options discussed right now, and the IPCC looks at it um, in this categorization based on the removal process, which can be land-based land biological, ocean-based biological, geochemical or chemical, and also on the timescale of storage. And that goes from decades to centuries to 10,000 years or longer. And if we look here at this, um, at this taxonomy, we see that carbon stored in terrestrial reservoirs, for example, soil carbon sequestration or forests has a shorter lifetime and that it's also more vulnerable to reversal. And this needs to be taken into account. How can we ensure permanence? Um, if you look, for example, at soil carbon sequestration, that depends on agricultural practices and for the carbon to remain in the soil, these practices need to be continued. So um, the permanence needs to be ensured here. However, only looking at timescales and removal processes um, is not sufficient. The options also differ with respect to other dimensions like the mitigation potential, the cost, potential for co-benefits, adverse side effects, technological readiness level. And if we look at that, um, the picture gets a bit more complete. So in that graph, you can see the potential uh, for removal on the x-axis and the costs on the y-axis. And if you look at that, we see that the options that before um, looked worse because they had shorter timescales of storage, now here have an advantage because they have lower costs and they also are often closer to deployment. And even that is not sufficient. There are also other criteria that are important, 
for example, the technological readiness, um, also environmental co-benefits or adverse side effects, or more in general, sustainability, um, and also social aspects. So what we would need to do to, to judge our CDR options is to consider um, all, of these, um, all of these aspects and consider policy instruments to ensure that CDR meets these criteria. For example, monitoring reporting verification to ensure the permanence of storage. Um, or certificates to ensure the sustainability and also possibly to address leakage if you think of biomass. So that means that we may want to deploy different CDR measures at different points in time, for example, starting with the more low tech options while still developing the high tech options so that they are available later on if we need them. Um, so in order to reduce the risks, um, the development of a portfolio of options um, can, can be used. Um, and in a, in a project, CDR Sintra in Germany, we are aiming to develop these kinds of roadmaps that take many criteria into account. And since I was asked to be very strict on time, um, I'm already approaching the end. So let me just close with this very short summary. Um, so we've seen that we need CDR to compensate residual emissions to actually achieve net zero. However, CDR availability is limited, it's uncertain, and it's costly, so therefore it can only compensate the last few percent. Nevertheless, we need to develop it now to have it available at sufficient scale in 2050, and the development of a portfolio of options can reduce risks. Thank you. Thank you a lot for that, Jessica. That was a very interesting, uh, very good introduction into what is a complex and technical uh, topic, of course. At the moment, we have very limited questions from the audience. So please, audience, you have the Q&A um, uh, function. Please use it to, to ask questions. Um, if any of the panelists have a question, of course, feel free to, to unmute yourself. I, I have one, and I'll unashamedly use my role as, as, as chair to ask my question first. Um, you talked about long-lived products. This is currently a bit of a hype um, linking uh, CCU and long-lived products and CDR into, into, into one basket. Um, the commission talks about uh, building element, wooden building elements and, and things of that type. Um, what order of magnitude would you put on the long and long-lived in order to make this actually into a, 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 a CDR potential? Yeah, thanks. That's, that's a very good question. Um, here in that graph, uh, the intention was mainly to distinguish the very short-lived products like synthetic fuels that are being burned almost immediately from longer-lived products. If we talk about how long is long, then we run into similar problems as for the um, categorization of the other CDR measures where we have timescales ranging from decades to over 10,000 years. So here, um, in that sense, CCU in long-lived products would fall into one of these categories depending on how long-lived the product actually is. So there could be products that live only for a couple of years that may not be very helpful. But if we think, for example, of, of um, building structures that have a range of at least decades, um, then that could be helpful. OK, uh, um, I, I could ask what helpful means in a sense. But um, um, yeah, we haven't received any extra questions. But of course, it's your presentation is only just finished. We have a longer Q&A part at the end. Um, so I would suggest that we just go on to the, 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 the next presentation right now. And then at the end, uh, Jessica, I hope you can stick around. Then uh, uh, maybe there'll be some more questions for you there. Um, next, we, we would like to go a bit deeper into at least the, the nature-based removals, um, BEX and carbon farming. And we'll start with, uh, with uh, uh, Professor Michael Norton from the European Academy's Science and Advisory Council. Uh, Michael, the floor is yours. You are, however, still muted, I'm afraid. OK, I work with the uh, European Academy Science Advisory Council, which tries to bring together the expertise in Europe's 28 academies onto policy issues. And we have done quite a lot of work on negative emission technologies in general, and BEX in particular. So I'll try and build on that work and try and put a sense of perspective and reality into the future debate on CDR. Um, the, the reality at the moment is that we failed year after year to even start to reduce global emissions of greenhouse gases and have already reached a deadline for starting rapid reductions to limit heating to 1.5 degrees. 
And one of the side effects of this failure is to cling to the belief that somehow we can, being wonderful human beings with techn infinite technical abilities, uh, remove vast amounts of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere later to compensate for our failures today. And uh, we think this is a rather dangerous and risky bet, which we think is unjustified based on the science. And we see some of those concerns mirrored in the latest IPCC report. And having looked in some depth at the scientific foundations for negative emission technologies, we are rather worried about the unjustified faith being put into these future technologies to deliver massive removals of CO2. And one of the reasons for this uh, faith is because of the IPCC models, which can easily uh, speculate on the effects of large removals in 2050 or beyond. And we find that some of these projections are the result of inbuilt biases, which lead to over-optimistic over outcomes, which firstly favour a deployment of future technologies in general, and secondly, BECs in particular. And I'll just briefly go through these in my five minutes. Firstly, in general, uh, I'm not going down. Why is this not going down? Um, uh, Okay, firstly, as a general feature, um, the models use a discount rate, which is rather high, four or five percent for environmental issues, uh, which have been recommended more like one percent. If you start changing this fundamental economic assumption, then you get very different outcomes and models would be putting even more urgency on immediate mitigation and downplaying the roles of CDR in the future. And you'll find that mentioned in the IPCC, which is on the right of the slide in red. The second issue is uh, on particularly on BECS. So I'll talk now from BECS. Um, in, in the SR 1.5, the models were allowing, were allowing quite high watering quantities of of CO2 to be captured from the atmosphere through BECS. And the right hand of these four figures included removals up to 20 gigatons per year. And the even the latest IPCC report contains ranges of scenarios that envisage uh, higher scenarios of biomass requiring hundreds of millions of hectares to grow. And these higher estimates in the latest IPCC report are four times what the IEA believed was sustainably harvestable in their report last year, and eight times some more recent reports which uh, here, which suggest there may be only 50 exajoules available, which meet uh, ability to uh, avoid competing with food and other requirements. So there is a, still a lot of uh, ambiguity about the quantity of biomass that might be available. And some of these larger figures seem to be ignoring the competing pressures on land for food production, for reversing deforestation and restoring ecosystems. And s s ideas that you can have land on the scale of two to three times the area of industry, India just seem like fantasy. <clears throat> Furthermore, when you look at BEX and its complicated and lengthy uh, supply chain and do all the emissions along which are not caught by carbon capture, it, it's quite likely that the technology will fail to reduce CO2 levels in the atmosphere soon enough to avoid dangerous climate change and overshooting into that territory, and in some cases may fail to deliver CO2 removals at all. You see that uncertainty reflected in the IPCC report. But some of the models that uh, de depend on BECS continue to apply, to apply the faulty premise of carbon neutrality of the biomass feedstock, which is what has led to the perverse outcome of the current bioenergy policy, whereby the huge subsidies have merely increased levels of CO2 in the atmosphere for periods well below the time we have to meet the Paris Agreement targets. Moreover, the current bioenergy industry has shown itself to be, to be dependent on harvesting <clears throat> forest stemwood to a large degree, despite all the public relations and promises to restrict feedstocks to residues. And there is no guarantee that developing BECs would do anything else than increase this trend, despite all the talk of biocrops such as miscanthus. 
Finally, more biases exist in IEMs, which uh, are covered in our latest report, but I don't have time to go into them at the moment. But all these have uh, uh, the effect of raising a serious question marks over the ability to actually deliver. So our final conclusions on this are that regulations on carbon removals need to be fairly intelligent and should place a high burden of proof on operators to establish when in each specific project's combination of feedstock process capture and storage a net reduction in the atmosphere would be achieved. We shouldn't be going on faulty assumptions like carbon neutrality and we shouldn't be exploiting loopholes such as that in the framework conventions reporting that allows imported uh, pellets and woody material to be ignored for national emissions. So the accounting should be entirely from the atmosphere's point of view. How much does a given technology or a given project deliver in terms of removing CO2 from the atmosphere? And when will that be achieved when all the life cycle assessments are taken, taken into a place? And on that basis, we do not believe that adding CCS to the large power stations, which currently rely on imported wood pellets, can actually help. There may be some prospect for negative emissions from local feedstocks, particularly where these are genuine wastes or maybe rapid growing crops nearby to the power station or the biopex facility. And the key thing for the regulators is to avoid any CDR incentives to avoid just being uh, acquired by existing industries industries who are adjusting the current rules to their advantage despite negative effects on the atmosphere. We need to treat all potential CDRs equally and recognize that none yet offer outside nature-based solutions. This is none of the technology solutions yet offer a viable solution to current mitigation failures and should be treated as technology development targets as someone uh, our into introductory speakers already mentioned as like targets for innovation. So that, thanks for, for my opportunity to pass this information on. Thanks, Michael. I was about to interrupt you. So you uh, you, you just took to the time. Um, Celia, uh, up to you. You're uh, more specialized in carbon farming, which is, of course, the other side of nature-based removals. The floor is yours. Thank you, Wayne, and, um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, Indeed, carbon farming is uh, another very hot topic uh, at the moment. Um, but even though everyone, everyone is talking about it, it seems that no one really is talking about the same thing. So I'll start by clarifying that um, today I'm sticking to the definition used by the Commission in their communication from last December, which is focused on land management practices which ingre increase carbon sinks. So looking at forestry, peatlands, grasslands, and, and croplands. Um, and when we discuss carbon farming, um, I think it's important to know our starting point uh, and also where we need to get to or where we could get to. So when it comes to forestry, as, as has been mentioned, we have a fairly large sink which is shrinking um, and is uh, expected to shrink uh, further, as mentioned by uh, MEP Michael Pizik earlier. When it comes to other land uses, you can see here in yellow the, the current state of play and in green um, an estimation of the potential for the future. And you can see that where there is particular potential here is peatlands or organic soils, which are currently a very large source, uh, but can become a sink. Um, and there's also a very large untapped potential in agroforestry. Um, whereas croplands and grasslands could become, um, well, grasslands could become slightly bigger sink and croplands could turn from a source of uh, greenhouse gas emissions to a small carbon sink um, if we implement uh, agroecological practices and, and land management practices that restore soils and ecosystems. Um, but it's, of course, very important uh, to be clear about what is true and what is a myth in, in, uh, in the context of nature-based carbon removals. And it's uh, in this context particularly important to be aware of the fact that even though in from essentially all land uses, except for has, perhaps peatlands, we know uh, what we need to do, but we don't have very good modeling capacities for the 
carbon benefits of those practices. Um, so for example, for forests, we know that natural forests are more resilient, are better for biodiversity and store more carbon in the ground, but we are lacking the models to estimate the carbon benefits of close to nature forestry. The same is true for grasslands, for example. Um, it's also important that we have this issue when it comes to harvested wood products. This has been touched on already by, by previous speakers, but um, it's actually extremely complex to estimate the uh, carbon that's stored in, in uh, biomass that's harvested. Um, and there's large uncertainty. And also we know that a lot of the carbon gets lost during the processing. So that makes it very hard to estimate the net benefit uh, from a mitigation perspective from substituting fossil products with wood. Um, what we do know is that carbon stored in forests is better than carbon stored in products. So we need to strike the right balance in how much we rely on forest biomass. Um, at, at the moment, we are already exceeding that limit in many cases. And this is the situation is also true when we're looking at agricultural land. Um, where we don't have good models yet to estimate the carbon fluxes or greenhouse gas fluxes and, and the carbon cycles. Um, and we are still also lacking a lot of information. We still have a lot of gaps in our knowledge of the carbon cycles uh, when it comes to soils. So there is huge uncertainty. That's the short message here um, in how we measure and model um, carbon cycles in, in natural uh, ecosystems. And then in addition, as uh, has already been mentioned, natural carbon sinks are not permanent. And there can be intentional or unintentional reversals which make biogenic and fossil carbon not fungible also because they operate on, on different timescales. So once we have those facts clear, um, that then needs to inform the approach that we take in the way that we promote um, carbon removals in natural ecosystems. In addition to these, these elements, there are also further risks, um, which must be recognized when we're promoting carbon farming. And uh, the main, but, but not the only ones that I want to highlight today are linked to the fact that if we create, um, if, if we adopt a narrow focus on counting and trading carbon, when we promote carbon farming, we could create very perverse incentives and we could boost greenwashing. That is a very real risk. And in particular, um, there is a big risk of promoting the wrong solutions um, because we don't look at the whole system, but only at the carbon. Um, for example, afforestation with monocultures or um, solutions that are perhaps increasing the carbon, but harming biodiversity in other ways. And that is something that we cannot afford. In addition, um, there is a real concern that, uh, especially when we adopt um, mechanisms that will reward carbon farming based on the amount of carbon measured, measured and, and sequestered and through carbon market mechanisms, which require additionality, we could create a very discriminatory system um, because the pioneers those that have already been applying good land management practices for many years or many decades, as well as um, land managers that are in, in regions which don't have large carbon sequestration potential, for example, due to the climate conditions or, or the soil conditions, um, they will lose out from a system which requires a very strict additionality. And so this highlights the importance of um, designing measures that um, will protect existing carbon sinks and will support all land managers to um, maintain and to increase those carbon sinks in the future. And then finally, another major risk that's linked with uh, carbon markets in the land sector is that they could create further pressure on land um, and competition between food and carbon, which is something that has already been seen in different regions of Europe. And so I'm concluding with the last slide, um, which shows that um, it's not all myths and risks, there are opportunities. Um, and I think the, the myths and risks that I have mentioned do show that the stakes are very high when it comes to how we incentivize carbon farming. Um, if we go down the wrong path, 
we could make uh, irreparable damage and waste very precious time. But we know what the right solutions are and they are ready to be implemented here and now. So the key really is to focus on the storing ecosystems, both below and above ground. And, and you can see here listed some of the practices that we know will do this. And if we do that, uh, we can reap benefits for the climate, for biodiversity, for land managers, and for local communities. Um, it's really uh, a, <laughs> this huge win-win-win potential. And we know that the cost of action will also be much lower than the cost of inaction or of wrong actions. So this is really the way to go. Thank you very much. Thanks, Celia. Um, we have time, I think, for one question. Um, there's quite a lot of good questions coming in. Many of them I will punt to the end because they're a bit general and they cross uh, cut cr across lots of the things that we'll discuss later as well. Um, but there is one I think that, that I think is, is highly relevant here. And that is on why um, bioenergy is still considered carbon neutral. Um, Michael, I, I think that's maybe one that you want to take, but the other panelists, please, if, if this is something you have strong opinions on, uh, take the floor as well. Well, it, of course, if you put that to some of the regulators, they say, oh, we don't assume it's carbon neutral. But um, in, in practice, uh, that's how it works out. Um, the reality, of course, if you look at the life cycle, is that, as the questioner mentioned, when you uh, harvest trees and, and turn them into pellets and then burn them, that's an instantaneous release. And the carbon neutrality over the longer term is based on the assumption that that forest will regrow and reabsorb the same amount of carbon that was in the, in the biomass that was harvested. And that introduces this time lag, which is not recognized in the regulations. And that where, that's where a lot of the problems come from. We call it a carbon debt uh, when it first goes into the atmosphere and it requires a carbon payback period before that overall neutrality is reached and depending on the types of feedstock that payback period may be centuries or it may be just half a maybe a five or ten years it's very critical on the type of feedstock and the regulations have not yet got that into the uh, to being challenged and that's why we have uh, these large million tons of pellets being produced, they originally were meant to be from these short, short payback period residues, but of course there aren't enough of those, so they end up having to do a lot, quite a lot of stemwood harvesting, perhaps up to 50% for a, a typical pellet mill, and that of course brings you into this delayed where you're actually making climate change worse for decades and getting subsidies for actually making it better. That's why the inherent perverseness of the system has still um, not been tackled effectively because partly because of the difficulty of measuring and monitoring and such, but also because of some of the vested interests clearly don't want to lose those billions of subsidies. Thanks a lot for that. Um... I, I propose that we go to the next panel. However, I would invite the panelists, and I see Jessica has already done it, to have a look at the questions. And if you see one that, that's uh, addressed towards you, just uh, just answer it and typing. You can use the Q&A uh, for that. Um, I'd also, again, reiterate to our hosts that if there are specific topics you would uh, like to ask our experts about, please feel free to, to unmute yourselves. Um, but we'll have time for that in a few minutes as well. Um, so let's move on to, to we've, we've looked a bit at, at the more of the science and, and where it is and the framing. Um, and let's move maybe a bit more towards the policy sphere um, and what we think that CDR in Europe could look like um, and, and what it would need and what kind of safeguards are necessary. Um, and for that, uh, first, uh, uh, Duncan uh, from the University of Lancaster, um, please. Thanks, sorry. I'm just trying to find my uh, slides again. That's, uh... <laughs> they were there a moment ago. Present mode. So thank you very much for the opportunity to, to talk briefly today. Um, I'll plunge straight in, given the limits on time. Uh, CDR is, as People have already said necessary, but only a supplement to accelerated emissions reductions. My understanding is that I've been asked to, to talk to you today because of research I've been part of looking at how 
um, ideas of carbon removal might interact with those processes of emission reduction and in particular the risks that the uh, the former thinking about pursuing carbon removal might deter the latter um, the emissions reduction that we so desperately need uh, so why might that interaction be problematic well the the lego bricks here are basically to tell us that these things can't just be treated as um items that we can pile on top of one another. They do interact in much more complex ways than that. Um, our research found several mechanisms of what we call mitigation deterrence. Uh, Michael's told us about one of them, the way the integrated assessment models discount future costs, ignore the um, implications of uh, these technologies under underestimate the co-benefits of emissions reduction and so on and as a result uh, give us a sort of very childish uh, uh, simplified view of what uh, might be possible with carbon dioxide removal and exaggerate the amount of it um, we also found problems in carbon markets particularly where they treat all units of carbon dioxide as directly equivalent, regardless of whether they've come from biological or fossil sources, whether they're going to decay quickly or slowly, um, or how much we know about their uncertainties. Um, and particularly in carbon markets, the sellers tend to know far more about that than the potential buyers. So you have this uh, information asymmetry, and the result is quality goes down. It's a classic market for lemons. There's also a, a whole lot of over-optimism, and I've written here technological over-optimism, but we see the same sort of over-optimism about nature-based solutions. There's magical thinking going on in, in both areas, um, and in particular about the uh, the, the result of that uh, belief that we can capture carbon very cheaply in things like carbon farming or forests suppresses the price of carbon on markets. And I mean, why would you spend £200 to capture a tonne of carbon if you're told that you can buy an offset for £5 that does the same thing? Um, and this is where the corporates are going. We're seeing corporate interests grabbing carbon uh, removal capacity, particularly saying, yep, we're going to offset our emissions with new forests here or there or with um, soil carbon removal or whatever. Um, and the result is not just that, um, that they're not doing the emissions reduction, but they're potentially claiming more carbon removal capacity than actually exists. So we're getting double counting. Um, I should move on. When we add all this up and, and we looked at models to try and do this, the analysis of the model suggests that there's a, there's a very realistic um, chance of about a 0.7 degree additional temperature rise over and above 1.5 as a result of these effects. And in the worst case, it could be as much as 1.4 degrees centigrade on top of a 1.5 scenario. So virtually doubling the, the outcome temperatures if you take these uh, problems and uncertainties about the future delivery of carbon removal into account. So how do we minimize the risk? while actually supporting what we want, the development of, of usable, valuable CDR capacity. Well, first, everyone said it, minimize the scale we need, minimize the amount of residuals that are going to be offset by carbon removal. I like to talk about it as uh, imagining putting two things on a seesaw. If you have to balance two elephants on a seesaw, it's difficult and you're probably going to break the system. If, on the other hand, you're balancing two mice, you've got a small amount of residuals and a small amount of carbon removal, then maybe you can do that safely. Um, we've argued and, and would argue strongly for separate, say, setting separate targets 
and separate accounting for emissions reductions and carbon removal. So not just a sweeping net zero target, but breaking that down. There's a need for much better standards of monitoring and verification. In, with many of these techniques, it is literally impossible at the moment, may always be impossible to verify how much carbon is being captured, as well as whether it's staying in place, whether it's permanently stored. If in assessing them, we look at side effects and co-benefits too, then we get a better picture of which forms of uh, carbon dioxide removal are feasible and useful. If we involve publics early, we, un we will understand what limitations politics and social factors might put on different technologies and makes the opportunities for certain approaches clearer. And we can reform the way we use models so that we have used them as sandpits, not truth machines. It, there's some good work suggesting simply not allowing the models to give a temperature overshoot will take away a lot of the discounting problem. So how do we get in that case, then how do we actually get CDR of the right sort started? And particularly so we can make it available to other countries too, where the residual emissions might actually be more socially valuable. I mean, we're not talking about offsetting business flights here. We're talking about offsetting the methane from rice paddies, for example, the, the basics of life. Well, three things I want to say, learn from history. We didn't get renewables going because we had an emissions trading scheme. It happened because we had feed-in tariffs, renewable obligation certificates, contracts for difference. They, these were things that provided direct support for particular sorts of renewables in particular places. And that's what we need for the right sort of negative emissions. Um, so that might work through incentives or through mandates but it won't work through relying on carbon pricing or offsetting markets. And we could design appropriate targeted tools for CDR, um, tax credits or advanced mar market commitments might help um, in this case. Um, final couple of remarks going on what's already been said. I think we need to be really careful not to mix up geological and biological carbon. We do need to um, reach a situation in which we are not trying to compensate for more fossil fuel coming out of the ground by putting more carbon into biological systems. Restoring those systems is about putting back carbon that we have released from them over millennia of agriculture and deforestation. It's not about compensating for more oil and gas. So. Yes, we do want nature-based solutions, but we can't rely on them for net zero or carbon capture. Um, we need to keep them out of carbon markets. Thanks for your time. Duncan, that was a very stark image there of the, of the potential negative effects on, on emission reductions. And I think that's a message that really needs to be in the top of people's minds. I'm happy that you ended a bit more positively in, in a way forward. Otherwise, I would have been completely depressed. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, Ulrika, you're, you're our last speaker before we return to our hosts for their, for their uh, reactions to this. Um, we are running a bit late, so um, Ulrika, no pressure, but uh, okay. uh, <laughs> up to you. Thanks, thanks Vainad. Actually, I have a quite a bit of uh, repetition, but I have a bigger font size at least. Um, so um, thanks for this opportunity. Five messages from European NGOs. Little disclaimer first, we definitely need removals, but emission reductions need to remain a priority in the EU's climate policy. The message from science is, is, is very clear, latest now from the IPCC, only drastic urgent emission reductions in the next three, five, eight years can help us from the worst impacts of climate change. But going to our messages on, the, on CDR, so what is CDR and what is not? There's a quite a bit of uh, confusion at the moment. CCS, CCU, CDR, very similar acronyms, but all doing very different things, aiming for very different uh, outcomes. So for us and for 
for the scientists. We, we, we find this Tanzet Ramirez paper very helpful when we define what is negative emissions and what is not. Uh, CDR needs to be removed from the atmosphere, so from the ambient air, from the 418 parts per million mixture. It needs to be uh, stored in a manner that is permanent. All the associated gases need to be accounted, and then what is left can only be considered as negative emissions. Only net removals can be can be certified. So this means that CCS and CCU do not do not qualify. And this is now also like also already mentioned. IPCC is also now now clear on this one. And then a second thing. One of our major concerns also mentioned today is, is that when we bring removals into the policy discussion that loosens the pressure on, on fast emission reductions. And uh, the scientific paper one after the other come to the conclusion that the best way to avoid this mitigation deterrence is to have a separate dedicated target uh, for for carbon removals that is not fungible with uh, with other with fossil emissions. So in the European context, this of course means that uh, ETS ESR need to stay separate, and we need a new new separate target where we can uh, regulate um, uh, carbon removal. So this is particularly a message to the to the policymakers. And uh, thirdly, this is of course very limited, very linked to the to the previous one. A separate target, no offsetting. So when there's no fungibility, there's no offsetting. So um, offsetting at at best is a uh, is a uh, is a uh, zero sum game. But uh, given all the inaccuracies, asymmetry that has been also identified by the IPCC and, uh, and the measurement uh, difficulties and the reversals, it's, it's not quite even that. So therefore, removals need to be in addition to deep and urgent emission re reductions and not in, instead of. We think that all, all sectors need to do their utmost. And uh, this does not mean that we want to undermine the need that we need urgently removals, but there, there needs to be both of them. And we are of the opinion that if we now bring offsetting, uh, if we now allow offsetting, that does nothing else than delay mitigation. And this also applies for, for voluntary markets. We don't also see uh, a benefit in, in offsetting in the, in the voluntary markets either. And fourth message, that when it comes to land, Carbon cannot be the only metric. Celia already talked on, on this issue. It provides us everything we have. And it would be foolish to assign land just for, for, the, for the removal, carbon removal abilities. And even more foolish would be to assign land for, for companies who claim carbon neutrality and at the same time continue emitting. There's a number of win-win-win opportunities already outlined by by Celia. And then finally, uh, the, the upcoming carbon removal certification mechanism, what should be the role of that? So we believe that it should de determine what is good CDR and what is not. Bad CDR is not CDR. Impermanent CDR is not CDR. So uh, CCU should not be included into, into this policy instrument. And it should help, it should set a strict quality criteria for carbon removals that can be counted towards this separate uh, EU removal target. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ulrika. You, uh, you sped through your slides. Uh, it's much appreciated. Um, before we go to a, a longer Q&A, and we've got quite a few very interesting questions popping up, um, I'd like to first go to a reaction from our, from our hosts. Um, I have understood that, Mr. Vizik, you don't have any uh, uh, urgent time constraints. I don't know, Ms. Kutland, if you do, um, but if you do, then perhaps it's better that you go first uh, so that uh, we can hear your voice on this. I, I could actually, I, I have a couple of minutes, so I could be 
uh, it was very polite to let me start last time. I could actually turn it around uh, to be. <laughs> Um, that, that was my initial plan as well. So then that's yeah. perfect. <laughs> Mr. Vizik, let's go to you then. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the beautiful interventions of our speakers. I really appreciate uh, hearing that really, really solid, solid facts being presented in this way. And I have to say that uh, all that has been presented is uh, in full concordance with uh, what I perceive the problem. Uh, but saying that, I also have to admit that uh, these ideas uh, might not be that much reflected uh, by the majority of, of my colleagues in the uh, European Parliament, which is a pity, but uh, it's not only the pity related to European Parliament, but to all the complex of, uh, of decision makers within the European Union, as, as might be uh, reflected by, by many statements and by many indications that you might already have seen uh, with in uh, the published uh, legislation and, and, and so on. So I, I'm, I'm really a little, little bit worried that um, there is a lot of uh, resistance uh, in, in the decision process to really uh, accept these facts and, and uh, implement them. Uh, well, they, they may be implemented in, in sort of, of strategies, but when we go to the, to the legislation and to the implementation process, there, there is uh, re really a lot of loopholes and a lot of weak places. and. These usually are intentional, uh, and, and well, let's let's say it frankly, also related to the to the system that <laughs> keeps on working in in the, in the old model and and the money involved and all that stuff that already has been also mentioned by our beautiful uh, lecturers. Um, I maybe will be well interested in one one specific topic which bugs me a lot, and that is that is the biomass and especially the woody biomass. Um, it seems that uh, there is no will to really get rid of uh, the biomass and there is also a strong will to stick to the idea that the uh, energetic use of biomass is carbon neutral, which is definitely not, not true or, or is very problematic to uh, pursue it in this way, uh, which was mentioned by the, by the problem or the issue of the carbon payback time. But not only that is the problem, uh, there is a lot of additional uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, connected to the manufacturing of, 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 of the biomass itself uh, connected to the leakage from the from the forest soil which is being exposed after the, after the clear cutting or, or uh, whatever practice so so there is a lot of additional carbon that needed to be accounted and is not accounted properly for and in that uh, regard I'm really uh, pretty much worried that for instance um, uh, Franz Timmermans also mentioned biomass as being a crucial precondition to reach our uh, climate goals, and this is really something that I'm I'm, I'm not very happy to hear about. Nevertheless, uh, we are we are really working with biomass quite a lot. I'm not uh, very happy about about the outcome, but at least some improvement is there uh, on the table. Uh, we see a lot of distortion of the market uh, due to the incentives that went into the burning of biomass and the woody biomass. Uh, we now see the lack of uh, high quality biomass for, for instance, for the wood uh, manage, uh, wood manufacturing industry uh, because so much of the volume goes into the incinerators. And uh, this is something we try to reflect on. But uh, it seems that the only realistic outcome will be that we will try to distinguish between primary biomass and secondary biomass or, or secondary woody biomass, where primary biomass is uh, a directly uh, harvested biomass, which uh, should be intended to be used in, in different ways than, than by burning. And then the secondary woody biomass is uh, in a sort of a waste from, from, from these processes. And we really try to... Uh, persuade our, our colleagues that uh, there is no real uh, uh, real uh, good intention when, when we are when we are burning the primary woody biomass where we are incentivizing this uh, burning and when we are accounting uh, the emissions towards our cl uh, climate goals uh, and we are also quite uh, strongly fighting for the cascading use principle in this regard. So my question to, to our, our, uh, our uh, uh, honorable guests uh, and presenters is uh, whether, whether you perceive it as a sort of an improvement or is uh, just some, some detail that uh, will not uh, really help us with, with the situation. And if so, uh, what would you actually, actually suggest? Are we really 
have to get rid of the biomass in order to achieve the improvement or is there also some some other way thank you Shall Michael, I? I see you want to answer that, but I, I do suggest that we first go to, to Ms. Gutelant and yeah, then yeah. perhaps you can answer that one yeah, straight yeah. after that. Okay, but I, I see your enthusiasm to answer and I, I appreciate that. So, Ida, please. Yes, first of all, I would also like to say thank you to all the interventions. Uh, I think it has been uh, important to, to listen to the ideas and also the concerns. And um, I think also I would... Um, echo, of course, many things that uh, Misha was uh, saying uh, from Parliament side, we of course need to use the potential of, um, of the removals and we, we need to make sure that the uh, legislation doesn't prevent us from doing that or create uh, loopholes. I could really uh, support that in general. I would also like to say that from uh, one of the interventions um, we heard about the importance of not uh, creating double incentives or incentives that would maybe go against uh, each other. And I think in my work, uh, I will uh, primarily focus on the ETS reform and their one incentive uh, that could uh, be double is if we um, have a ETS uh, um, market that would uh, not have as a main focus to, uh, to get reductions for the industry and energy sector. Uh, it could actually be a contradiction if we, uh, if we bake into the system, so to say, the removals and that it doesn't become very clear on how to separate these two very important um, um, parts. And therefore, I think in my work, I would focus on the reductions when it comes to the UAs and uh, the, the work with the, with the price mechanism. But then on the when it comes to the removals, we can definitely improve the innovation fund and uh, by doing so, we can encourage uh, installations to, to use the potential that is there. And I can also mention that um, when it comes to incentives, that it's also important that uh, we, we separate those who have the great potential of reduction and doesn't need uh, the removals to, to, to work, they should definitely focus on reductions. And that's why the ETS system is so important. Uh, but there are, especially later on, extremely important to reach the uh, net zero uh, target. It is important that we use removals. And therefore, uh, I think that we have a potential here for, for many installations. When it comes to the forest policy, I think we have a little bit different uh, views on, on the incentives here, me and, and my colleague from uh, the, the parliament. We have maybe some differences, um, but also, of course, agree a lot. Um, I definitely don't want to see a situation where we don't use the potential of the forest. And um, I also think that uh, the carbon uh, um, should be captured uh, and we need that both from the forest industry and also in the agriculture industry but that said i also see that uh, rightly done uh, a, a good managed forest can be used for both and i think actually my home country shows that that you can have bigger um, you can use the forest as a bigger sink uh, and really use the potential more um, with more efficiency in the future and still be able to substitute uh, fossil fuel products by, um, by uh, forest products. And that is possible, but you have to do it with respect of biodiversity and I have to use uh, the forest correct. And of course, it's not about burning um, round wood. It's about uh, making sure that you have a 
a good principle in how this is done. But I think we need to, to, to see that as well when we, when we speak about removals. Thank you. It's a very, it's a very astute uh, comments there, uh, especially considering that, of course, all of this is on the table right now on your desks uh, with the LULUCF, ESR, ETS votes uh, upcoming in, in MV in a few weeks time. Um, so we will, of course, continue our outreach to your colleagues, because I think many of the things you said uh, make a lot of sense, but these are indeed not things that are generally understood or, or, or defended by, by all the groups, um, unfortunately because um, a lot of nuance is, is really lacking in this debate. Um, but let's let's move on to questions and answers. Uh, I won't abuse my role as, as host too much, as chair too much, sorry. Um, on the cascading principle, Michael, I, I think that's something that you wanted to react to. I, I was just uh, re responding to Mikhail's um, comments. Yes, so I think the cascade principle is a very important principle. And the problem at the moment is because of the inherited renewable energy directive sub size of the subsidies, there's an inherent economic bias in forestry, forestry utilization, which puts bioenergy bio higher in that cascade than it should perhaps be from other perspectives, either that is the reuse of, uh, of resources. So cascade, uh, developing that is quite important. Also, you, know, you mentioned LUWCF, there is an attempt by the commission to create a, a balance to uh, demand for bioemergency by encouraging uh, maintenance or increasing of the carbon stock. So again, that is a movement in the right direction, but it it um, is still in its early days and still needs work to uh, de develop. Um, I think um, you mentioned primary and secondary biomass. I think what we've found in experience is that regulatory definitions are incredibly flexible um, when it comes down to commercial and economic decisions. Mm -hmm. And uh, the whole of the biomass uh, concept started off with using residues which were just going to waste, either being burnt or left to rot. Uh, but of course, when it comes to actually feeding a, a half a million ton a pellet mill, you've got to get that feedstock and you aren't going to get it just by going around and picking up leaves. You get it by going to a farmer and saying, can I clear your land? And, uh, and the land may include some good um, trees, suitable, but it'll also include trees which are not suitable for long lived timber products. And that gives the, the vision that we're using uh, low value timber. And uh, you see this uh, excuse uh, persist throughout the, um, throughout the industry. So the definition of primary secondary might look good on paper, but I think uh, probably you need to have a um, uh, practical uh, foresters uh, advice at the same time. One one final comment um, is that the comments today, I think, raise the question, are we yet ready for this sort of regulatory measurement mechanism? Do we have the monitoring and measurement and and verification systems capable of actually judging whether something deserves a certificate or not? And I think there's a lot of evidence that we don't yet have that for a lot of different technologies. And I think maybe there'll be some advantage in going back a step and saying, look, we're really in the stage of technological development, a whole of concept development, and not rush too far into creating yet possibly more perverse market incentives. I think that's a very strong message there, Michael, and it, it, it fits with what the Commission was actually planning initially. Um, they were thinking of pilot phases and the certification mechanism would take its time and we'd learn and we would be able to implement this type of systems, build them from the ground up. But it seems that uh, the political expediency has caught up to that idea of taking our time, um, which is a pity and, and, and we for one will be trying to advocate for maybe taking a bit slow and, and having the time to develop these systems, um, be able to test them. Um, I'd first like to uh, give Duncan and Jessica the floor for, for any reactions that you have, um, and then I will go to Celia and, and Ulrika, and then there's two or three questions from the, from the audience that I'd like to ask to all of you uh, for your reaction before we close off, because uh, we, we are running a bit over time, so I hope people don't mind that we don't end at uh, 20 past sharp, but a few minutes later. So Duncan, Jessica, if you have any reactions to what you've heard uh, the, the past hour, please feel free. Uh, a very brief one, which is that because so many of these techniques are really hard to measure and understand the, the, the impacts, but they have 
um, valuable co-benefits, particularly for biodiversity or for agricultural production or whatever, we should be looking for ways to support them on the basis of those co-benefits and treat any carbon as a bonus so that it doesn't go into accounts and isn't treated as a marketable thing that allows us to offset it against emissions, but that those techniques are still being pushed forward. One of the big problems we have is that people concerned with, say, biodiversity are grasping at straws to say, oh, maybe we can get some more funding for biodiversity by turning our biodiversity into a carbon asset. That isn't going to help. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for that, Duncan. Jessica, do you have uh, uh, any reactions? Um, actually, I've, I've uh, answered some of the questions already in the chat. So, um, I've, I've Thanks a lot for that, by the way. You were very diligent. Most of my comments uh, down there. Um, yeah, so it's good to know. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. Uh, much appreciated. Um, Celia, Ulrika, if you want to take the floor now is the moment, otherwise we'll go to uh, questions from the audience. Um, sure, thank you, Wayne. And just a, a couple of words from me, um, I guess to echo uh, what Duncan just said, um, which is that I think everyone in, in this room here agrees that we do need to boost natural carbon sinks. Um, but the, the key question really is how are we going to do that? And how are we going to reward or sort of create the incentives to do that, uh, also in the way that benefits biodiversity? And uh, Focusing on a very sort of quantitative approach um, that rewards specific tons of carbons or whatever unit we might use for biodiversity uh, brings a huge amount of complexity, uh, really creates discriminatory incentives, as I mentioned, and, and really comes with so many questions that it really um, is worth thinking twice about whether it's, it's that's the right way forward. Um, and yet that's the, the approach that the Commission seems to be taking um, so the really this sort of idea of uh, certifying tons of carbon removed and then selling that on, on the market. Um, so, yeah, just to sort of uh, repeat again that message that we do need to do it, um, but there's there are other ways to do it and we should really explore uh, what are the best ways to, to do this, that we reach uh, all of the benefits that we could have. Thanks a lot for that. Um, uh, Ulrika, you 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 were okay well, I, well, actually i wanted to say something similar to celia it was really good to hear from you duncan especially on the on the ways that we can we should be incentivizing uh, cdr in europe and i think that uh, ngos we tend to we tend to look at all the dangers at first but we all are in this uh, seminar webinar are all very much aware of the of the gigaton challenge that we have so this is definitely we say no to few things uh, many things maybe but we need to also now find the find the solutions and and that's uh, that we already heard a little bit on on this one but we will have still a bit of work ahead yeah and, uh, to pick on up on that and what, and what celia said right now is of course the moment to give our opinions on this there is the commission um impact um sorry call for evidence for the carbon removal certification mechanism that uh, that closes on monday um, so also for our audience to call upon you to, to please respond to that, uh, to make sure that they have plenty of good ideas to work from, um, because to be honest, at the moment, the, uh, if it's based on the sustainable carbon cycles communication, I fear that there are many mistakes that could be made. Um, I'm going to be a Democrat, and there are two questions that I've got a few more um, thumbs up than the others, so I'll ask those. They're also a very good general questions, so that anybody who feels like answering them can please uh, uh, come in. And then in about five minutes or so, we'll uh, we'll wrap up to make sure we don't go too much over time and uh, upset people's calendars. Um, so the first question um, is from Niels. Reductions and removals are inherently different. Uh, and he refers to permanence. They can't be treated alike. What are good ways to reflect those differences in regulation? Uh, Duncan, you've, you've already presented some ideas on that. Maybe you can give your, your, your top idea, like the, the key uh, for you, and if others have uh, great ideas to to add to that, please uh, please just unmute yourselves. Well, I mean, the crux of this is is to recognise them as different in regulation, and therefore have um, distinctive targets um, and accounting mechanisms that are tailored to um, the the differences, so that 
at least in on the removal side, yeah, you're looking at how permanent, how long that uh, that removal is going to stay out of the system as part of the question, but you're going to look, and this is probably starting to answer Mark's question, I see as well, but you're, you're going to look at whether you're um, storing carbon in a, in a biological form or a, a geological form, because I, I really think that mixing those two up is, is almost as bad as mixing up uh, removals and emissions reductions. Um, and, in a sense that one of the, the, the regulatory things that happens as, as a result of this is that you can notionally talk about offsetting um, residual emissions with removals in a way that you cannot talk about offsetting residual emissions with avoidance offsets, because there aren't going to be any of those once you've got to net zero, because every reduction that is possible has been made. Um, so they do need different regulatory and, and incentive structures. Yeah, maybe we can link that to the second question because you've, you've already linked them and then uh, people can react however they want. So the first one was about the differences between emission reductions and removals. The second is about whether there is a, given the differences in permanence between land sink removals and geological sink removals, should there also be separate targets between those two? Um, I'll, I'll open the floor. Anybody who wants to, to, to pick up on that, please just do so. I, I would, if I may. Um, so in my opinion, it's not only because of the differences in permanence, but it's also because of the difference in cost, technological readiness and potential. Um, if you imagine that we would have a target only for removals in general, what is likely to happen is that we would start with the options that are ready to be deployed and that are relatively cost effective, cost efficient or relatively low cost. Um, but all the so-called technological options like direct air capture um, that require more research and development and that may also require a bit more investment into infrastructure because we would need the CO2 transport and storage infrastructure and they're also more expensive. Um, that would probably not uh, take off. So if we want to incentivize the development of these kinds of removals, they would need maybe a separate target, but at least separate instruments. I, I see a lot of nods and thumbs up. So I think you, if nobody disagrees with that, maybe we can take one more um, that I've seen asked in a, in a few different ways, um, which is politically relevant right now. And we'll, that's about the, the, the carbon removal certification mechanism that's coming up. What would it be a good thing to include in that? What would be bad to include in that? We've got a few different questions aimed at what should it look like? Um, if people have any uh, ideas on that, I've got ideas, but I'm sharing, so I can't give mine, but maybe other people have ideas. Um, so feel free to, to respond to that. I know that for instance, Celia and Ulrika, we've been working a lot on, on, on replying to this questionnaire. So maybe you have some ideas you want to bring. If, if nobody wants to be put on the spot, of course, then we'll we'll just wrap up here. But uh, I can okay, try. Why not? I mean, I see Olega is not unmuting herself, so I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, I mean, this is a, a very important question and something that, as you said, we, we've been, I would say, grappling with. Uh, it's, it's a really complex one. Um, but I think there's kind of two dimensions to this. There's the, the questions around the, the supply and the demand, as the Commission has put it. Um, and so the Commission say that they focus on the supply. So this, according to them, this uh, certification mechanism is only about determining what is a ton that is removed. And if that's the case, then uh, what should it include? Well, it should have very robust rules for uh, having good measurements, um, integrating, uh, you know, the dimension around impacts on biodiversity, on land use, um, if, and, well, baselines, uh, notable counting, all of those things. But there's a, a big question also about what will be the use for those certificates. And it's very unclear so far whether that would at all be addressed by this framework, but it's hard to see how we could have a framework certifying carbon removals that is completely neutral uh, and says nothing about how those certificates will be used because if the certificates are to be traded, then that creates different requirements for, for the, the 
for, for how they are created, then if those certificates are to be used, for example, in the common agricultural policy or for financing from the EU Innovation Fund or other national financing, which would then go into the national inventories. Um, and for example, then the major difference would be the question of additionality and liability um, in, in the case of for, for those credits. So additionality for, for the, the individual projects and liability in case of, of reversals. So all of those questions really will have to be addressed by this framework. And for now, we're not getting a very clear picture from the commission um, as to how they're going to, to do that. Um, but we are doing our best to at least shape our own thinking and, uh, and feed that into the conversation. Thanks, Celia. And sorry for putting you on the spot. Uh, Duncan, you put your hand up. Yeah, I just was going to add to, to some of that. In fact, I was going to say some of the same things about monitoring and verification. Um, it's It has really struck me in, in advising projects on uh, enhanced weathering, on um, even ocean capture and on soil capture, that none of these actually know how to measure the difference between the carbon that is in the system now and the carbon that gets in the system as a result of their intervention. They only ever do so through some form of vaguely precise model that tells them what they think is going to happen in that circumstance. And every one of them, when they've tested them in reality, have found that those models are not actually very precise. So get some good rules on the actual verification of the capture. And a lot of these things are not going to get certificates. And I'm sure politically that wouldn't be the, the, the answer that they want, but that's a, it's an important thing to have in. Obviously, actually doing net removal, not gross removal, as, as has been mentioned, getting appropriate standards for durability and permanence, doesn't mean that there can't be a, cert, a sort of certificate that says, OK, this is 100 year permanence or this is a decade permanence. Those things are still useful if we are trying to accelerate our progress towards 1.5. But we can't be putting something that's only got 10 years in the same bucket as something that's permanent for, for millennia. Um, and finally, we do need to look at social and environmental side effects. We can't go certifying things that are going to be grabbing land from subsistence food production or water from desperately water <laughs> short areas. Um, the, those things have got to all be included in any form of genuine certification. Uh, very interesting comments. Uh, also on, on the political side, like what is politically needed or, or or wishful thinking like let's we need to have something on this and i feel like carbon farming and I, I might be stepping on some toes here in the panel i feel like carbon farming is one of those topics where it's become politically necessary to do this rather than science-based that it will actually lead to what we need it to do um, and that we're, we're cutting corners just to be able to have a carbon farming system in europe whether or not that's actually it's being incentivized for the right reasons um, we are we are nearly 10 minutes over time so i'd like to wrap up here um i'll, I'll quickly give some of my main conclusions of, of what i've heard today and and what i think are, are the most relevant things um obviously this this hasn't been the first and it will not be the last event on, on cdr uh in eu policy there is a massive hype on this topic um i think tomorrow there's another event by your active last week there was politico um big players are, are entering this field because there is a hype on this um, especially because like, the, the current EU climate targets, as, as, as you mentioned, and also the, the commission proposal that's due by the end of this year on carbon removal certification mechanism. It's very disheartening to hear from, from Mr. Wiesig that there is resistance to a science-based approach to CDR um, and its EU policy implementation. Uh, you mentioned the, the carbon neutrality of biomass as being one area where the political expediency uh, is, is seen more important as actually the scientific need. Um, Carbon removal is complex, it is technical, but I think today we've we've heard some fairly simple principles that could or, and should form the basis of an EU policy approach. Um, emission reductions should remain the primary focus. I think we're all agreed on that. We cannot get to 1.5 degree uh, without uh, deep and urgent and sustained emission reductions. 
Um, and the potential impact that, that Duncan sketched on the effects of medication deterrence are very, very stark and a very big warning that, that over-reliance on CDR has major risks and that we should not forget those risks when, when talking about this. Um, we should talk about it as something that's limited and that has a, a purpose, but that cannot solve everything. Um, that said, CDR will be necessary. It will be able to do some things. We need it to compensate for those very last residual emissions. We need it if we want to reach net negative emissions, which uh, the, the EU climate law is clear about. Um, but the, the order of magnitude, as Jessica brought, uh, of, of those last residual emissions is also very clear, um, around 10% of current emissions. So that means that we still need action and pressure to reduce 90% of our current emissions. And we need that action urgently, and we need that action now. Um, so how do we rhyme these two imperatives? No over-reliance, yet we will need removals. Um, I think there was a lot of focus here on, on that removal policies should really just focus on real and high quality removals. Atmospheric greenhouse gases captured, stored permanently, uh, meaning at least several centuries, um, with all related emissions taken into account. Uh, biomass is clearly a lot of concern of where the biomass comes from, also where the land comes from, where energy comes from. Um, otherwise, we might actually be causing more emissions than we are removing, and we might cause significant harm to other environmental and social priorities through pressure on biodiversity and land grabbing, and these are not things to be taken lightly. Uh, the do no significant harm principle is, a, is part of the bedrock of the European Union and shouldn't be forgotten in this topic either. Um, we should also not offset emissions, in, especially in the ESR and ETS, to ensure that emission reduction efforts are not undermined. And we can see the first attempts at, at offsetting continued emissions with removals in those frameworks. Um, in the current political uh, uh, files, we have seen amendments in both ETS and ESR that aim at promoting removals as a offsetting tool for, uh, for emissions. I personally think, and I think many of the panelists would agree with me, that this is a mistake and, and we cannot go that way. That, that, that is a dead end and that does not help us reach our targets. Um, but we need to keep those policies, we need to keep the ESR and ETS really focused on, on these urgent emission reductions. We're kind of already pretty far behind where we need to be in order to keep 1.5 degrees in, in reach, and we should not be uh, putting in place policies that would increase that distance. Um, no offsetting means keeping removals and emissions separate, separate targets, separate policies we've heard about. Um, otherwise, we can't seem to uh, uh, ensure complementarity rather than substitution. And in the current absence of a separate policy, I think we heard something very interesting from, from Yuta. We can start by using these EU climate funding mechanisms that we already have. Um, the Innovation Fund, it could be a very appropriate silo to get started with building knowledge, testing approaches, and getting ready to, to scale up CDR while ensuring that we do not undermine other, other parts of our climate framework, climate policy framework. There, uh, we, we talked a lot about MRV. Um, and there are definitely some practices that could lead to removals, but that would be very, very challenging and very expensive to apply strict MRV to, especially in long time horizons. Um, those are the, the practices that are easily reversible and difficult to set liability for, especially liability on, on several century scale. Um, I think soil organic carbon sequestration is probably the prime example of this, but th there might be others as well. We might not be doing the best we can if we incentivize those as removals, but we should incentivize them nonetheless. They are important and they deserve to be pushed um, due to their significant environmental and social co-benefits. Um, and I think the, the, the language on carbon is being currently seen as a bonus, uh, while it actually, no, sorry, carbon is currently seen as the primary goal, but actually it should be seen as a bonus, carbon as the co-benefit rather than the focus. I think that's, that's a very interesting thought on that side. Um, and the common agriculture policy and other policies could be better suited to focus on those rather than, than uh, carbon-based climate, uh, carbon-based uh, uh, carbon markets. Of course, car all carbon markets are carbon-based, but you know what I mean. Um, when it, boost, it comes to boosting natural sinks, I think the approach should be focused on restoring ecosystems. And we will need a mix of, of carrots and sticks to deliver this and to maintain those benefits in the long term. Um, to conclude, the EU will need a dedicated removals policy framework that is separated from the ESR, ETS, and other emission reduction policies. It's an area where we need to advance, but we need to advance cautiously. Um, and that means we cannot undermine more urgent emission reductions. To really wrap up, I'd like to say on behalf of the, the organizing uh, um, uh, organizations, the European Environmental Bureau, Climate Action Network Europe, FERN, and Carbon Market Watch, I'd really like to thank our, our hosting MEPs and their teams for their, their cooperation in making this happen. 
uh, our speakers, uh, especially as we gave them so little time to answer very broad and very complex questions. And they have years and years of experience in these topics. And I, I know we, we broke your hearts a bit by only giving you a few minutes uh, and, and cutting into that. Um, and a special thanks to, to Michael, who joined us from uh, uh, the other side of the world at an ungodly hour. Thanks a lot for that. And finally, uh, thanks to everybody who took part. I, I hope you found it as interesting as I did. And I look to seeing you. I look forward to seeing you around this space. Uh, we will remain active in this. Um, a pleasant afternoon to everybody. Goodbye, and uh, and see you next time. <laughs>